We are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts 1975's The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Since it is Pride Month, I wanted to examine this classic. Damn it, Janet, I love this movie. I know, I know. Just like me, you cannot wait for me to dig into this classic. I realize that. I see you shiver with anticipation. So once more, let's do the time warp again. I hereby solemnly swear that I will not sing this entire video. So, yeah, absolutely love this movie. This, there's going to be some serious stuff in this video, but it's going to be very positive, and there will be some jokes. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in some parts, you can just skip ahead to certain ones via the time codes in the description box. Now, full disclosure, I am a straight cisgender man. I don't say that because I'm afraid of someone mistaking me for gay or trans or any other, some such thing, any other letter of LGBTQ+. I'd rather be mistaken for a trans man than a transphobe, gay than homophobic, or trans woman. Anyway, I say it up front, I say this, I say it to say up front that I don't have personal experience with certain of the things depicting this movie, but I will try to be respectful because I don't want, I, I don't wish to offend any minority. I don't judge anything that trans people or gay people do. They have just as much right to love, acceptance by family, friends, and society, sex to a life where they can be themselves as we cis and straight people do. I am going to be discussing some of these things. I might be wrong on some of them. I try not to be. If someone watches the video and really thinks I'm wrong, especially if they're a trans individual or otherwise a member of the LGBTQ community, let me know. I am willing to take this video down or edit it. And, you know, if, if it would be okay to just edit it, please let me know which parts that you want me to edit and how. And... I fully realize this movie was not made for me, and that's not something that bothers me. I'm really glad that something exists, that a lot of trans people and gay people find a lot of joy in something that makes them feel seen, accepted. I'm not going to judge this movie based on what I personally like. If there's something in it that I don't personally particularly like, but I understand that trans or gay people do, I'm not going to criticize it from my perspective. I will try to go into some of the problematic elements, but not because of how it affects me personally, but how it has affected and can affect trans people and gay people. And the reason I make this video is that a number of cis individuals will not listen to anyone outside of their own group, and so might not hear anyone go into this movie who is at the very least an ally of LGBTQ. Full disclosure, I have not talked to anyone gay or trans about this movie, and I understand why some will feel that I should have. My social circle is already very small and does not include very many, and I feel uncomfortable approaching someone outside of my social circle and opening with this movie. I'm bad at social interaction under the best of circumstances, and I worry that I would end up saying something wrong if I tried to discuss, discuss such a sensitive subject with someone else. I do not avoid people who are LGBTQ. I simply haven't met very many who were out, who didn't pass. It's entirely possible that a number of people I've met were trans, gay, bi, and I just didn't know. I do know one person who is gay, but he's more than twice my age. He's very educated. I can imagine a lot of people have asked him about this movie through the years. He might be absolutely exhausted with explaining it to cishet people. So, here we are. And I did watch... Some the ones I could find YouTube videos made by LGBTQ people talking about the movie mean what the movie means to them, including one who actually realized they were not straight because of it. Very heartwarming. So when I say something about the movie that LGBTQ individuals love, I mean that as a positive, not negative. And also, I'm I want to be clear. I'm not saying that everybody under that rainbow does love it. Some people do really take issue with it. I am not going to begin criticizing LGBTQ people in this video. I hope I never have. I'll try not to. I I try not to. And oh, also, I did not go to an audience participation show and thus will not be reviewing that experience. I am told it is superior to watching the movie by yourself. 
I can't speak to that. It does sound like fun. There's an article on the Mary Sue that makes the case for no longer watching the movie due to the things in the movie that are today not considered acceptable by the trans community. I am not going to argue against it, and I will link to the article in the description box. I bring it up for anyone watching this video who thinks they might agree with the article and would rather read the article instead of watching a video where a cis man goes in, into aspects of the movie that some trans people like. Personally, I truly hope that the movie has helped far more trans and gay people than it has hurt, but at the same time, if you hurt even a single person who's a member of a minority, you should have tried harder not to, and the fact that you maybe also did help people doesn't make it okay that you hurt people. So... There we go. And... Yeah, I may in this video use loaded terms like cross-dress, cross dress, drag, possibly others. I use them neutrally in description, not negatively. And I... I understand the logic behind reclaiming the Q word, and I don't want to take that away from anyone who wants to do that, but it does not feel right to me to use it myself. So, in, you know, in places where I might say Q word, instead, I will say LGBTQ. And, right, and if you're someone who just wants to hear about the music, dancing, humor, and such, I will be talking about that in this video as well. And obviously I was, you know, this is my first viewing, but I was fairly aware of this movie. Parts of it were shown to us in school when I was in maybe the fifth grade or something, which I realize means that you have now real, you are now 100% aware that I am not American because that would not be a thing or, or someone would have gotten fired over it or something, but no, they they thought it was great. You know, teachers, students, the, the principal thought it was a great idea. So, yeah. And I know some of the songs from their use in pop culture and such. I know a lot about the movie from cultural osmosis. I've listened to science fiction double feature probably at least a hundred times. There was a time when I could recite every single lyric. No, don't worry. Once again, I promise I'm not going to be singing in this video. Due to my love of several of the movies that it talks about, I could do the Time Warp riffraff voice decently well. Now, also, I will not be talking about any other version than this one. You know, not the not the live show, not the it's remake, I guess, from, from 2016 or something like that. I'm going to do what I can to not sound completely clueless, which I have seen some individuals just kind of not do the research on this movie, just watch maybe just some scenes, maybe the entire movie, and post a reaction video, and they'll say something offensive clearly without meaning to, or just not really understand what it's about, essentially confused that there's a piece of media out there that's popular that's not cishet. Now, I mean... Yeah, I just, I, I want to briefly highlight, there was one written user review of this movie that said it was, and I quote, gayer than the Rocky movies. I look forward to this guy's review of water where he points out it's wet and gravity for how all it ever does is make things fall down. So the movie is rated R and so this is this video, but it's not hugely for language, so I'm not going to, you know, swear a lot in this video. Yeah, I, whether you love this movie, hate this movie, or anywhere in between, I don't have a problem with you unless you're a transphobe. And I definitely think, you know, you can, you know, there are cishet people who love this movie. There are trans people who hate this movie. So, you know, if, if you hear someone say that they hate this movie, you know, hear them out. It does not mean, you know, yeah. I mean, there are people who love this movie who just think of, oh, wow, this movie loves the, those 50s and 60s sci-fi schlock movies as much as I do, you know, so that's, it. and that is a reason to love it, because it clearly does, like, there are a lot of references, you know, uh, I don't know, it's probably not very obvious if you don't already, 
if you haven't seen it before, I'm going to try to point, let's see, the, just to make an absolute sure, yeah, the, that is a box set of 50s and 60s. Actually, I might all be 50s. I love those movies. 50s sci-fi movies, and they're just, yeah, they're, they're so much fun. If, you know, if, if you can at all abstract from the way we expect movies to look and sound today. You know, and there is sadly a little bit of sexism in, in at least some of them. But yeah, they're, they're a ton of fun. And that set does include a couple that are referenced in science fiction double feature. So, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I'm probably going to be speaking faster in at least some parts of this video because my back is still in pain. Right. So, yeah, I, I, this is probably the only version of this that I'm going to review. I wouldn't mind going to a live show, but I'm probably not. I'm not really a live entertainment kind of person. And let's, yeah, so I do not, there's not a lot of musicals. Honestly, I don't, I don't think I've ever watched a musical that I didn't end up liking, but it is just like, it's, they're not really a genre that I'm used to, and sometimes I have a hard time going outside of my comfort zone, but yeah, a couple of, you know, I, I made sure to put the one musical that I have a physical copy, yeah. Blues Brothers. But anyway, yeah, so some, well, I, I mean, I did consider putting, I, I do have a physical copy of Team America and the South Park movie, but there's some transphobia in, in South Park. I'm not sure there's transphobia in the Team America movie, but that is still Matt and Trey, and for a while they were very transphobic, and so, yeah. Anyway, some musicals I love. Team America, South Park, Blues Brothers, the first one, not the 2000 one or whatever it's called. Tim Burton, Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. And yes, I have been told it is apparently not as good as other versions. It's the only one I've seen. The Nightmare Before Christmas, Moulin Rouge. Let's see, the animated Disney catalog up to and including... Tarzan? Is that one? I'm, I guess that one might not... Is that a musical? I've only watched it like once. I don't even remember if there's any singing in it. There might not... Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I've, I've watched all those and I enjoyed all of them. Obviously some of them are very... Yeah, problematic today. And, and other than that, I did also watch the... It's Tangled. But I have not watched any between Tarzan and Tangled and none since Tangled. Now, given that this movie is older than I am, like, it's, you know, it's, it's not quite old enough that someone born when it came out could be my father. But it's not that far off either. You know, the, you might be worried that I'm going to judge it by a modern standard. Compare it, by which I mean rate it by the standard of, you know, movies that I've grown up with, that are released today. I'm only going to be comparing it to movies that came out at the same time that I'm familiar with and hold in high regard. It's, you know, so obviously there's significant difference between this movie and the original Halloween, but yeah, the... Also, I, I said earlier that I wasn't going to criticize this movie if it didn't really, like, work for me. Honestly, I don't think I really have anything. I, I don't have to keep myself from saying something in there. There really was not really anything about this movie that just... Yeah, the couple of things that, you know, some trans individuals have found offensive were the absolute only thing. 
the first Rocky movie, although obviously it's focused on a different idea. It's, you know, yeah, different, different goal one. Yeah. The original Superman, again, different. I'm not sure I'm familiar with any musicals from the 70s, although I'm fairly familiar with Westerns and Bond movies from the 70s. I don't think it makes that much sense to compare them to this. And I'm not going to be comparing this very much to 50s and 60s horror movies that this is in part a tribute to, since it is very different than those and, you know, intends to be. Now, oh, also, um, you know, yeah, my making jokes in this should not necessarily be, take, necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad. I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K and over uh, everything I watch. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, right, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind, so feel free to watch something in another tab. So yeah, I streamed this and thus didn't pay extra to watch, you know, Disney Plus charges you the same, whether you, you know, you're watching stuff 24-7, or whether you never watch any stuff on it, so, you know, when I saw that this was available, I thought, I've been told my whole life that I should try to watch it, I'll try to watch it. But yeah, so, anything negative to say in this video is not out of bitterness, I don't feel like the movie wasted my time, nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. And it's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what I was expecting to the best of my ability. The negative things I say in this are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now that does bring us to... Right, since we're still dealing, dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, yeah, I base this video on the Disney Plus version. There were a couple of things that were definitely, I guess, yeah, so the, the, some versions of the movie feature the song Superheroes, the Disney Plus version. The Disney Plus version in Europe does not. And it also cuts... There's a, there's a part of the movie where someone says tender subject or something like that. And that leads to something. Now, the thing it leads to is still there. But the line and implication are edited out and if you're gonna edit something I can kind of understand why that would be a thing to yeah now yeah and I you know there very little time passed between me finishing watching a movie and hitting record and yeah you know I added it I added this movie to my list of things to review I don't think it was right when it was added to Disney Plus. I did, for a while, I was a little worried that I was going to end up saying something really stupid and offend trans people or, you know, anyone not straight. So, yeah, held off for a while. Then I worked up the nerve, did my did some research, and yeah, here we are. So, the plot. This is set in 1974. Denton, USA. A hetero heteronormative, aka boring, couple's car breaks down, they go to a nearby castle, as you do, for a phone, and suddenly they're in the company of very unusual people, and they're in for a wild night, and that is as much I'm, as I'm going to say here. Let's see. Oh, right, the, uh, yeah, IMDb compares this to the 1986 Little Shop of Horrors. It wasn't really my kind of thing. I, I can't fault the talent. It just wasn't my kind of thing. Compares it to Beetlejuice, which I can kind of see, yeah. Uh, that one I did enjoy more, but, you know, since watching it, I've watched Maggie May's video, and, uh, yeah, it's apparently quite problematic. I watched it as a kid, so I don't honestly remember. But, yeah, it compares it to The Addams Family from 1991. 
I agree, and I love that one as well. Heather's Rocky Horror Show live stream theater. The 2016 version, Edward Scissorhands, Adam's Family Values, which I also love, and Edward Scissorhands. Clue, which, again, not really for me. Shock Treatment, which I haven't watched and not currently planning on, and Grease. And yeah, on Disney+, Plus, it's compared to Moulin Rouge, which for me is a 10 out of 10. The Greatest Showman Into the Woods, Hamilton, Sister Act, Ed Wood, Return to Oz, and Newsies. And uh, those I have not watched. So, yeah, and, and before I start talking details about technical aspects, let me start by saying the people are very talented. There's a lot of skill and enthusiasm on display here. Now, let's see. That brings us... Yeah, so the... From Wikipedia. The film is both a parody and tribute to many of the science fiction and horror movies from the 1930s up to the 1970s. Film production retains many aspects from the stage version, such as production design and music, but adds new scenes not featured in the original stage play. The film plot, setting, and style echo those of Hammer horror films, which had their own instantly recognizable style, just as Universal Studios horror films did. The Original proposed opening sequence was to contain clips of various films mentioned in the lyrics, as well as the first few sequences shot in black and white, but this was deemed too expensive and scrapped. And in this year, 2022, this movie is still in limited release. 46 years after its premiere, it is the long longest running theatrical release in film history. So, yeah. And the. I could definitely see the the thing with the the opening sequences in in black and white that could definitely have worked uh and and apparently like some versions did do that to change the the version on Disney plus from now on when I say the version on Disney plus I'm talking about the European version yeah the version on Disney plus does not make any change to the the color as far as I can tell I'm not going to talk very much at all about the live show part participation, but from watching a few clips, evidently during shows, whether of the film or live stage performance, people will shout something that has an MSC3K or Mystery Science Theater 3000 quality to it, underlining, some, underlining something that was said or arguing with it, like telling a character what they actually want them to do, or what they should do instead of what they're doing, often crass sexual. For live shows, the performer may be interrupted and have to regain their composure and continue or follow up the line, perhaps acknowledge what was shouted, either agreeing or disagreeing. I get the appeal. I love MSC3K. Now, let's see. I guess... Yeah, uh, also Wikipedia. Beyond its cult status, the Rocky Horror Show is also widely said to have been an influence on countercultural and sexual liberation movements that followed on from the 1960s. It was one of the first popular musicals to depict fluid sexuality during a time of division between generations and a lack of sexual difference acceptance. The amount of sex in this is through the roof. Whether you're into men or women, this has some remarkable specimens, and often in underwear. I should be more specific, not like graphical sex, but there are a lot of references, and I suppose they're more implication than explicit, but yeah, the, yeah, do, do not show this to someone too young to, to see it, because that's definitely, yeah, not, not because of trans or gay stuff, because of other stuff. And, yeah, so this was written by Jim Sharman, who also directed it, and Richard O'Brien, who plays Riff Raff, and, let's see, and I, th yeah, and, and uh, I forget if Jim Sharman had anything to do with the stage show, but Richard O'Brien 
was right it's yeah it says it right here richard o'brien wrote the screenplay and the original musical play jim charman wrote the screenplay so and yeah he also wrote shock treatment the the sequel which did not do as well which i've heard some people say that it's actually really really good it's also just like lightning doesn't strike it's the same spot twice you know but it's it's too bad it sounds legitimately good and yeah so you know yeah jim charman he directed it he wrote it and shock treatment and shirley thompson versus the aliens and a 2021 thing called A Pandemic, 50 Fans Celebrate 50 Years of Cinema. Oh, yeah, the, some of the characters he wrote are featured in that. He didn't write something. Yeah. And the 2016 one is based on a screenplay by. And, yeah. And Richard O'Brien, in an interview, Richard has described not feeling entirely like a man or entirely like a woman. I have heard trans individuals refer to Richard using they, them pronouns, so I intend to do so as well. If I at some point slip up and refer to them as him or he, I assure you it was on accident. I'm not trying to misgender them. And as far as I can tell, the character Riff Raff identifies as male, so I might be refer, you know, yeah, I might refer to Riff Raff as him, but I'm not. I'm only referring to the character, not the actor. And, yeah, you know, in addition to playing Riff Raff in, in this and the play, he, you know, he has a total of 23 movie credits as actor, 22 for TV, 2 for video game, 1 for short, 1 for video, and, yeah, he has the, the same four writing credits for movies. And let's see. He created, it says, the Rocky Interactive Horror Show from 1999. I want to play that very, very badly. It looks amazing. I mean, it's yeah, from 99. Even if I could get a copy, it, it probably wouldn't run properly. It it really I've seen a couple of videos. It looks so much fun. It looks like it really captures the the show. And and that is I think if there is a chance of capturing the show, it's to go to a different medium. You know, it worked when they turned a stage play into a movie. Although some people feel it didn't completely work, I can imagine it worked to turn it into a video game. Also, you know, but a movie sequel don't think and and it also like it it doesn't feature a lot of people's favorite characters and that was uh, yeah which makes sense considering circumstances but still now let's see yeah so part of the appeal of this movie is the hedonism the celebration of doing what you want not what society asks and Richard O'Brien was According to Wikipedia, was living as an unemployed actor in London during the early 1970s. He wrote most of the Rocky Horror Picture Show during one winter just to occupy himself. Since his youth, O'Brien had loved science fiction and B-horror movies. He wanted to combine elements of the un unintentional humor of B-horror movies, Portense's dialogue of shock horror, Steve Reeves' muscle flicks, 50s rock and roll, into this musical. O'Brien conceived and wrote... The play set against the backdrop of the glam era that had manifested itself in British popular culture in the 1970s, allowing his concept to come into being. O'Brien states, glam rock allowed me to be myself more. Now, I'm not too proud to admit I had to look up what glam rock even was, but yeah, it, again, from Wikipedia, it involves playing with other genders, being camp, and hydrogenous, so, you know, that's where that came from for this. Now, I, I, I should also note, one, one critic pointed out that apparently O'Brien has said transphobic things, so, yeah. And...
Right, quoting a fellow critic here, The creative mind behind the whole Rocky Horror project, both film and stage show, Richard O'Brien needs to be commended for bringing together such a staggeringly wide range of ideas into one relatively coherent entity. He's obviously an avid film fan, so he packed Rocky Horror full of references for cinephiles to lap up, but he's also they're also a talented song and screenwriter, musician, and of course they portray the decidedly creepy yet strangely likable handyman Riff Raff. Now, oh, right, and and some people point out that the plot is not exactly the best element of the movie. Honestly, I had I had heard such before watching this, so I kind of just let the movie. You know, I I just went with the flow, and if you do that, you know, I feel like you you have a greater chance of liking it and enjoying the experience than if you're constantly struggling and trying to, like, it's not really about the plot, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, it's about the way that... You know, yeah, something that some LGBTQ people really love about this movie is it shows some of the experiences that they have, although they're not, like, literally one-to-one, -one, but they're, you know, there are similarities, and the characters are not ashamed of who they are, and, yeah, the, you know, if you just... Again, it wasn't made for me, but I can still appreciate, you know, yeah, you should be yourself. You shouldn't feel ashamed of being different. Uh, you know, the, the thing with, if you're, there's a, there's a, there's a Futurama episode, and I realize also Futurama, there's some transphobia there, but there's a Futurama episode where a character goes from being unique to being very normal and the show clearly thinks that it's better that they're unique and one particular hammering home of that opinion is when one character refers to them saying you are nine let's see nine million nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine out of 10,000, or wait, yeah, out of a million, obviously, but yeah, just one shy of one million, and that says it perfectly. I think normal and ordinary are boring. There's, there's nothing there. The things that make us interesting are the things that make us different, and yeah, a number of people don't appreciate that, and so they feel insecure, you know, some people bully others because, and just, yeah, we really need to get better at accepting each other. Now, yeah, so the direction. So once again, this was directed by Jim Sharman. And other than this, he directed Shock Treatment, The Night the Prowler, Summer of Secrets, and Shirley Thompson vs. The Aliens. And he also directed a short in 2012 called Andy X, which I think he also wrote. Now, when this movie came out, a lot of the subjects were considered to be taboo, and for sure some still are. The movie very smoothly goes between creepy, tense, fun, funny, sexual. It's really, really, yeah, like the the Like, I knew that it had all of those things in it. I was not expecting how smoothly the transition between them are. The tr transitions. And let's see. This is a movie... Uh, Quoting fellow critics here, this is a movie deliberately intended to be schlock entertainment. It makes that obvious. It's a cliched idea of a new of a newly engaged couple who are forced to enter a strange house 
see all sorts of weird things and people. It's campy and meant to be so. Let's see. It has been celebrated for nearly 50 years and has not only brought people closer together, but also inspired those who are different to believe that they can belong without sacrificing who they are in the process. Aspects worth mentioning are the occasional great songs along occasional they're all great songs anyway along with a mixture of movie styles that is if not unique uniquely effective agreed it's zany wild unpredictable and that's what makes it a cult classic it's best described as high camp that is to say the film is a masterclass in gaudy costumes flamboyant song and dance numbers and hammy dialogue it's fully aware of what it is and is not afraid to exploit it to the nth degree So yeah, this has a really great opening. I don't know how much I want to give away. The Yeah. This is from Wikipedia. The film starts with the screen fading to black and oversized disembodied female lips appear overdubbed with a male voice, establishing the theme of androgyny to be repeated as the film unfolds. The opening scene, science fiction slash double feature, consists of the lips of Patricia Quinn, who appears in the film later as the character Magenta, and Trixie the Usherette in the original London production, where she also sings the song, but as the vocals of actor and Rocky Horror creator Richard O'Brien, who appears as Magenta's brother Riff Raff. The lyrics refer to science fiction horror films of the past and list several film titles from the 1930s to the 60s, including The Day the Earth Stood Still, which I don't own a copy of, but I have watched. It's amazing. Flash Gordon, The Invisible Man, King Kong. It came from outer space. I have a copy back there. I will do a video on it eventually. But I got a quite long list. Dr. X, for... Bitten plant. I don't think I watched that. Tarantula, once again, copy back there. The Day of the Triffids, Curse of the Demon, and When Worlds Collide. And... Yeah, so... In the script, the credit... According to IMDb Trivia, in the script, the credits were to be shown between clips of the movies. Production designer Brian Thompson disliked the idea and suggested using a pair of disembodied lips to mouth the words. Inspired by the Man Ray painting, I should have looked up how this is pronounced before, A l'heure de l'Observatoire, Les Amoureux. And, yeah, if, if you speak French, I you are 100% entitled to tear me apart in the comments because that was at least a little bit wrong I'm, I'm almost 100% certain so I'm not gonna give away in this part of the video whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending I just realized I forgot yeah I'm not gonna be spoiling the movie or anything else in this first chunk of the video the review section once I get into the thoughts section I'm gonna put up if you direct your attention to the top of your screen that spoiler tag and from then on out, I will be spoiling every aspect of this movie. But if I spoil anything else, I'll warn before I do so, verbally. But yeah, the ending fits what came before. I think the ending is absolutely perfect. I don't really... I saw some people really don't like the third act. I thought it was one of the best parts of the movie. There isn't really Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. It was all set up. And let's see. I never lost interest in in this movie throughout, and and it's important to note so that this video could be 
as you know so that I could properly process everything in the movie I read you know I only just watched it but I read pretty much everything in, that's in the movie you know on, on websites and so video reviews where people spoiled you know there was almost nothing that I didn't know was gonna be in there of course it's always you never know exactly what it's gonna be like especially with performances and editing and such I some people will think it was wrong of me to do so but I did listen to all of the songs and follow along the the lyrics before watching and and again it's still like even knowing exactly how it was like there's just they're they're so unbelievably catchy that I still really loved hearing yeah Man. huh Okay, so quoting one fellow critic here, Rocky Horror is definitely a film of two halves. The first half is a wonderfully chipper exercise in fantastical filmmaking. The second unfortunately drags as the film becomes too wrapped up in making a point, be it through the music or the bizarre costumes. However, the second half doesn't stop Rocky from being one of the most unique, exhilarating films I have seen in a while. With an opening hour that trundles along at a brisk pace to some loud and proud musical numbers, too wonderful to spoil. Yeah, the I I they were way harder on the second half than I, but yeah, I don't I don't know. I'm I'm not really sure exactly what it is that people found so so bad about the second half. I can't, it is different from the first half. That is that is true. Now the let's see. Yes, that brings us to the characters. So, Tim Curry is not the first actor to appear in this movie. But he is the, the top listed on Wikipedia. And he is the most fun character. Uh, yeah. He plays Dr. Frankenfurter, sometimes referred to as Frank. I, I'm i probably going to refer to him as Dr. or Dr. Frank. He didn't go to evil medical school for four years just to be referred to as Mr. The... I... Yeah... Before I get into my own, I, I wanted to briefly quote trivia. Tim Curry told Fresh Air interviewer Terry Gross that in the original play, he started out playing Frank Furter with a German accent, which does also, that does make a lot of sense. And Frank and Furter is a great kind of, you know, parody version of Frankenstein. But he changed that when he heard a woman on a bus speaking in a highly exaggerated English accent that reminded Curry of Queen Elizabeth II. He later combined that with elements of his mother's telephone voice to create Dr. Frankenfurter's speaking voice. He also said that his mother, a pretty hip lady, enjoyed the show, although not as much as she had liked it when he appeared in The Pirates of Penzance, because Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of Mother, had come to that. He is one of my all-time favorite actors for extremely specific roles. I've long loved his performances in movies like Legend, It, The Shadow, Home Alone 2, The Hunt for Red October, The Three Musketeers, Kinsey. He's even good in Scary Movie 2 and Charlie's Angels. A lot of people say that the his performance is one of the, you know, one of the most, possibly the single most, important in the entire movie. If his performance didn't work, then the movie wouldn't. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And yeah, I this might be my favorite performance of his. It's it's unreal how just the the charisma and the just he is so unafraid and so like there's no sense of 
you never get the sense that he feels ashamed. You know, it, it's his castle. So these two normies come in to his castle and he's like, he's walking around dressed the way he is dressed. I, I don't think I'm going to give away exactly what that is. At least not yet. And I never for a second got the sense that he was like ashamed to be himself in front of them or just like worry what they would think something like that and that is like this movie could have been made without Brad and Janet but it wouldn't be anywhere near what it is you know so a, a big part of the movie is contrasting their boring normalness with how fun and vibrant everybody else in you know everybody in this castle is just having the time of their life they're they're dancing they're singing they they are who they want to be and they're celebrating that now The best part of the movie is Tim Curry, his, uh, quoting fellow critics here, his portrayal of Dr. Frankenfurter is so honest and electric that he lights up the screen. He is so incredibly fearless in his actions and his performance. It's a pleasure to watch. And yeah, another critic said he blows uh, everyone else away, whatever scene he is in. And yeah. That brings us to Susan Sarandon as Janet Weiss, the heroine and Brad's fiance. I have to admit, I, I'm, I know that she's in a lot of things. I'm not sure I've watched very many of them. I do love her in Thelma and Louise. I think she gives a really great performance. And, and it's, I actually watched that fairly recently and it was quite the stark contrast to this. So that's, yeah. Like, I have to admit, if I didn't know about this one, I would have thought that she might be a little too square for, you know, this this kind of, like... But no, she fully embraces it. She, the, I never... In, in every second of her performance, I really felt like she is really enjoying being there. Like, and, and that actually, she, like, the the... She apparently caught, like, pneumonia, which, when you watch the movie, you can pinpoint pretty much, yeah. But, yeah, she she comes across as really loving, and she actually did interview relatively recently, like, much, much, you know, long after the movie came out, and said that she was very happy with having done it, and you know, yeah, spoke very positively of, of aspects of it, and yeah, just like, you know, she's she's supposed to be completely overwhelmed and scared a, a lot of the time, so she, like, widens her eyes, and she, you know, her, her face, like, she, she, yeah, she looks like she's stepped right out of one of these old horror movies, you know, just, and yeah, the the I wouldn't have thought she had it in her if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, but she really nailed it. According to IMDb Trivia, in a July 2021 interview, Susan Sarandon said she didn't plan to audition to play Janet. She just stopped by the set to say hi to Tim Curry, who was a friend of hers. While she was there, a producer saw her and asked her to try out. They said everyone they had auditioned so far were good singers, but none of them made Janet very funny, which is what they wanted. Sarandon said no, because she can't really sing. In fact, she's kind of phobic about it. So producers asked her if she can just sing Happy Birthday. She said yes. They convinced her to do it. They loved her and cast her for the role. Sarandon admitted it was all a lucky fluke, which I think is a kind of fish. And yeah, she is incredibly funny. Like, that's again, like, you could easily imagine that this role could be not 
funny at all. Like, she could come off as just super annoying and, and like, you know, I, I don't agree with those who say that women can't be funny. But I do think that this is, you know, she, essentially she's a character that we're supposed to laugh at and find kind of annoying and, and ridiculous and such. You know, she's, she's there to better contrast how much fun everybody besides her and Brad are. Barry Bostwick plays Brad Majors, the hero, and Janet's fiancé. Now, the song Damn It Janet, which is where he proposes, while partially the decision is made for the sake of the rhyme scheme, you know, yeah, damn it, Janet. The implication appears to be that Brad can't tell a woman that he has positive feelings for her without first saying, damn it, which back then, and for someone like him, that's about as harsh language as it gets. He has such trouble with positive feelings for a woman that that's how it comes. And, you know, which again, the, the, the people in the castle, the Transylvanians, are... Not at all. They have no problems expressing the, you know, their emotions. And, right. I just want to bring up the, the, according to IMDb, goofs. Incorrectly regarded as goofs. The criminologist mentions that the movie takes place in November. However, in the car, Brad and Janet are listening to Richard Nixon's resignation speech, which took place in August. This was added by the filmmakers to show that Brad is a nerd who has an audio tape of the speech. It's too bad that some people didn't... I almost wish that they had just, like, a thing where one of them pressed the stop button on on the speech or Janet was like how many times do we have to listen to that speech or something like that because a lot of people didn't pick up on that they thought that it was just you know some some people didn't realize that the the month discrepancy and some people said that it must be you know an oversight or something but it's actually great characterization because it really is that's yeah that's who Brad is he would get an audio tape of Richard Nixon's resignation speech. Like, at least get a speech from Nixon that's like, I mean, it was a pretty humiliating loss. You know, and, and not loss, uh, not election loss, but failure is what I'm... Uh, yeah. You know, he committed a crime, or had people commit a crime for him, and then he had to resign because back then it was seen as, you know, that impeachment might actually have worked, you know. And Brad has that on audio tape, you know, that's how big of a nerd he is. That's how much he loves Nixon, that even hearing Nixon lie his way through, uh, yeah. And, yeah, so Richard O'Brien plays Riff Raff, he hunched back. Candyman, Handyman, and Magenta's brother, and let's see, yeah, and according to Richard O'Brien, it was actually Riff Raff who did most of the work on Rocky Horror. Riff's a line, everything is in readiness, master, be merely a word, you know, word, is pretty clearly a stab at Dr. Frankenfurter. You know, we we await your word, not your deeds. So, yeah. And, I mean, I've always loved the voice because I've heard Time Warp so many times. But it really is just, yeah. And and also the physical performance, he's, he's deeply memorable. Every, every major character in this is deeply memorable. And Patricia Quinn plays Magenta, a maid, Riff Raff's sister. And, yeah. And, and Nell Campbell, credited as, as Little Nell, plays Columbia, a groupie. And really, Riff Raff, Magenta, and Columbia 
just have some of the most, like, like their voices are, like, it seems like it should be off. It's not quite what you would expect, but it just sounds so good. Like, it just really, I, I can't quite describe, I mean, obviously for the two women, it is the sort of high-pitched, and I forget who, I want to say it's maybe Columbia, who has this kind of nasally quality to her, you know, like some, like Fran Fine, you know, and yeah, it just, it sounds so good, it, it's really, like, I, mu I must have heard a thousand singers who had bland, ordinary, boring voices, and, and these, like, Man, they're just, they're so, yeah. And according to IMDb Trivia, Nell Campbell was asked to be in the stage play after writer and director Jim Sharman saw her busking on the streets of London. Ask, according to her, part of the reason Time Warp was written was to give her an excuse to show off her tap dancing skills. And really, there's no wonder because they are incredible. Like that. Holy crap. I'm I sound like a virgin. I, I I've seen tap dancing before. I have. I honestly. I I've you know I first saw tap dancing when I was still a child. But man, she could really tap. Holy crap. And Jonathan Adams, RIP, plays Dr. Everett V. Scott, a rival scientist. Peter Hinwood plays Rocky Horror, Creation, with Trevor White as the singing voice. And according to IMDb Trivia, Peter Hinwood is only slightly embarrassed by being in this movie. And contrary to popular rumor, he's never thrown anyone out of his shop for talking about the movie. He only sees, it, sees this movie as a part of the past and rarely talks about it. And really, like you could understand why he might be embarrassed because he I, yeah that's not really a spoiler like he you know he's playing the equivalent of Frankenstein's monster only he's muscly and like extremely close to nude for a lot of his screen time so so it really is like this is the kind of thing that you could understand if he was embarrassed about because you know at the time he was like I'm guessing in his 20s or 30s or something and very muscular and yeah you know at, no one at the time thought that this was going to be a, as big of a thing as it became or be around for as long at, as it has now been so, yeah, you know, he, he probably didn't think much of it. I'm really glad that he was able to, like, he apparently, like, didn't really want to act after this. And, yeah, opened a shop. And, you know, yeah, sometimes people who go there, go there to see Rocky Horror, you know. And, yeah. Let's see. And... Meatloaf R.I.P. plays Eddie X Delivery Boy, and according to IMDb Trivia, according to Meatloaf, Elvis Presley was the studio's first choice to play Eddie. Apparently, Elvis actually expressed some interest in the role. That would have been wild, but yeah, I mean, the uh, Eddie has a song that I could 100% have seen Elvis perform. In the original stage production in London, Dr. Everett V. Scott and Eddie were played by the same actor, which has become the custom in many subsequent productions. Meatloaf was disappointed to learn he wouldn't be playing Dr. Everett V. Scott, saying, I said you're making a huge mistake, and I still think they did, even though the actor was fine. The way it was in the play was that Eddie and Dr. Scott really looked alike, so you knew it was his nephew, and I was a really good Dr. Scott. And I could imagine that. And Charles Gray, R.I.P., as the criminologist and expert. He's been in Bond movies. He's played Mycroft Holmes. Like, in, in, in Bond movies, he's... I think he played Blofeld. So, yeah. And just... 
he 100% got it when when doing this movie he he gets that it is uh, he got that it was this the criminologist speaks slowly intently with purpose using like SAT words he's he's a he's a deep thinker this man so when he is talking about some of the aspects of this it just sounds absolutely ridiculous to have this you know brilliant guy dissecting something that the moment you stop to think about and that again that's the brilliance of it the movie itself points out because you could remove the criminologist he is a storytelling device he is not he doesn't go to the castle himself you know he's he's just telling the story but in doing so he he forces us to take that step back so that we're always aware that what we're seeing is kind of ridiculous you know where we're never completely just you know I, I like I said I I went with the flow of the movie but the movie itself never really just lets us just kind of immerse ourselves in the world it's it's kind of too there there are too many of these things that draw attention like multiple characters break the fourth wall you know some characters break the fourth wall multiple times you know just just yeah the the movie never really wants you to just be complete like the movie's always reminding you that this is you know it, it's not the norm but a lot of it really should be you know like that's the like if this movie was made today i think there's some chance that they would try to again the as far as i understand the 2016 one it goes with a lot of what this does i'm saying hypothetically if this didn't exist at all and the first time anyone made it was 2022 if it was made by progressive people i think there would have been some urged to make it seem more like more immediately appealing like the movie is almost daring you to it it keeps telling you you know Brad and Janet are the the good people they're the they're the normal ones you know all of these people are just weird and ridiculous because the movie knows that no matter what it does we're not gonna stop it is impossible to not love dr frank it i i don't know how you could not enjoy riffraff's presence all of these just yeah I, it, there was no character in this that i wish wasn't there or where i wish they had way more way less screen time you know the movie is well aware how unbelievably appealing these characters are so yeah it can keep saying you know oh but you know like riffraff is introduced opening the door and there's this creaky noise and he sticks his head out hello and the the hair and the face just they they did everything they could he looks like he stepped out of a frankenstein movie you know he and he kind of, yeah he kind of did he stepped out of this frankenstein movie you know and yeah it's just it's so and yet he's he he's such a fun likable character i mean maybe it, it it helps that he performs one of the best songs not just of this movie but of any movie ever very shortly after he's introduced but yeah just so yeah and Jeremy Newsom, R.I.P., plays Ralph Hapshat, which he he did an incredible job. Like he does not have that much screen time, but I remember him very distinctly. The yeah, and Hilary Farr, credited as Hilary Labau, played Betty Monroe, and she also does a really great job. And yeah, like there's impressive diversity. You know, the the 
the Transylvanians basically have every age group, or may maybe not children, but yeah, you know, young, old, dwarves, African American, white, men and women, androgynous. I'm almost certain I saw at least one Middle Easterner in there. It's difficult because they're always they're they're very frequently dancing. So you know, and and they, a lot of them wear sunglasses. So it's it's harder to get a. But yeah, um, I can't say for certain that there are any Asians in there, but quite possibly. Now let's see that brings us. Yeah, so something about the movie that some LGBTQ individuals love. Some of the characters are very catty when they talk to each other and others. The unusual characters in this are very confident in themselves. The castle and the celebration is where and when they can be who they are and not feel shame in that, shame that they don't deserve to feel. And... Yeah, the dialogue is incredible. You know, the IBB quote section has 84 entries, and all of them are great. Like, this has a lot of the most quotable lines of any movie ever. Whether a character is oblivious, cutting, insincere, overly detailed, they always express it with lines perfectly written and delivered. And, like, you could... If, if, you, if someone played... With you know, without visual, but just played a line from this, even even just very brief. Maybe it wouldn't even have to be a word. It would just like an utterance, like if one of them went um or uh, or something like that. You'd be able to tell what character you just heard because of how different their voices are and the way they deliver lines. You know, the, the riffraff has this put upon beaten down you know kind of thing where he doesn't you know he doesn't like he's not quite as as open to other people as the doctor is you know the doctor is just like immediately just you know bubbly and and just yeah and, you know, Brad and Janet kind of, Brad really kind of, kind of tries to take it in stride. Like, he's like, well, I guess they're, they're a bit different than me and, me and Janet. But, well, to each their own, you know. And, and Janet is, like, completely freaked out by a lot of stuff and just, yeah. Now, the cinematography was handled by Peter Sushitsky, who has 44 overall movie credits as cinematographer. And, let's see. Yeah, so he DP'd A Dangerous Method, Eastern Promises, History of Violence, Spider, Existence, and Butterfly, and Naked Lunch. So he's done a lot of Cronenberg. He also did Man in the Iron Mask, which, not a good movie, but well shot, Mars Attacks, and Star Wars Episode Five: The Empire Strikes Back. And, yeah, it, this is very, filmed very, very well, and this, that is a very important aspect of a movie musical, is how you film it. Because you, I'm not saying stage musicals are easier. Stage musicals, you basically, you, you know, you have the stage, and so you basically, like, you can choose to do a solo and just have, like, one person, maybe even a spotlight on them in the middle of the stage. You can fill it with dancers moving back and forth. I almost did a showgirls thing there. Or, you know, there, yeah, everything in between. But the moment that you're filming, you can basically, like, you you can go beyond filling the stage, you know, and that is also, I mean, when you watch this, when you see the time warp, you can kind of tell, okay, 
I can see how they used to fit this on a stage. You know, it 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 doesn't feel quite as natural in you know, yeah, but yeah, you know, you can you can turn the camera all the way around. You can film from above. You can you can film a hundred dancers and and intercut and all kinds of so you got to make some decisions and stick by them in or or it's going to be very inconsistent and awkward and you really don't want to do that when you're trying to get people to focus on the the dancing and the music and such you know again unless that's part of the point and that's really not the case here I think he did a really good job. The, it's, you know, there, there are a couple of parts where you can kind of tell, okay, this was, you know, turns out that the amount of dancers for the... Actually, there might be a few more than there were in the stage show, but for the, for the time warp, there's a part of it where you see, like, maybe a dozen dancers or so. And, like, okay... I guess maybe that's as many as are in the castle in general. But it is also like, you know, the moment that it's a movie, you can have... It, it might have been a budget issue also. Yeah, anyway. The editing is also really good, handled by Graham Clifford, who has 21 TV credits. Only four movie credits in total. Oh, hold on. 21 TV director credits, four movie director credits, oh, six movie editor credits. Anyway, other than this, he edited The Postman Always Rings Twice, not the original, the 1981 one. Fist, The Man Who Fell to Earth, Don't Look Now, and Images. I feel like I might have seen The Man Who Fell to Earth, but I don't think I've watched the other ones of those. But yeah, the yeah, and he's also listed as music editor for this movie, and only this movie. But yeah, he also does a really great job. Like there are edits where it kind of follows the music, and just like yeah, some some really incredible stuff. And also outside of musical scenes, like there's some really great effective cutting between like people's reactions to each other the, you know there's a there's this early dance bit where like yeah there's some dancing and then like Brad and Janet react to the dancers and the dancers react to their reaction kind of thing and yeah you know it's not like the most complicated thing in the world but it works. Like, honestly, when I read critics that didn't like this movie, it really sounded to me like, oh, I guess the cinematography and editing must be absolutely terrible. I have no idea what it is that people were like, yeah. But again, I'm not saying, you know, you can like this and still have, like, a sense of humor, not be a transphobe. You know, it doesn't mean that, yeah. And I mean, if you're if you watch this and you're too square for it, as long as you're not transphobic or homophobic, you know, it's it's definitely not for everyone. Okay, so the special effects, I'm going to say some things that would normally be insults, but it's clearly intentional. Like the the special effects here are just so deliciously cheesy and corny and just like if you showed me there's there's one particular bit of this movie if you showed it to me out of context and I didn't know I might you might have been able to convince me that it was from a movie from the 60s or further back they intentionally made the effects so bad that just and I, I absolutely loved it yeah and I mean, when the effects are supposed to be really good, they are. Like, the... I guess... Is that a spoiler? There's some... 
there are some sets and some designs that are tremendous. That's incredibly well done. The stunt work is also quite good. Now the this cost one point four million dollars to make, and the box office on Wikipedia says two hundred twenty six million dollars needs update. So I guess it's even more now, cause yeah, and it really like. I would not have thought that it was only if uh, that it was that low of a budget. I would have thought that it was much more yeah. I, I mean some of it is the the production I guess maybe wasn't as expensive back then and they did get a lot of mileage out of the set which was this castle that like actually was used for Hammer Horror Pictures. So, yeah. Now, let's see. But, but yeah, it is largely on sets and studio. Now. And, yeah, the, the movie's aesthetics are part of the film's appeal for many LGBTQ. Yeah, The Oakley Court is the the title of the, yeah and it was used for the brides of dracula and now the screaming starts the old dark house and murder by death oh wow ah oh. i got to find another copy of murder by death i love that movie so much have to see I, I probably already checked it's probably not on Disney plus I, I swear this won't take long I I gotta see no it is not I maybe I'll start looking for a DVD again but yeah I could totally see that that movie got great use out of it as well now that brings us to yeah so the music and let's see yeah the soundtrack is absolutely incredible and yeah again Richard O'Brien created a lot of it and in interview Richard O'Brien said that when he made the original musical you know when they made the original musical describe themselves as not having an education in making music, but they thought that might actually be to their benefit because they could make a really catchy song without obsessing over making everything perfect, which was something that they saw their peers struggle with, the ones that did have an education in making music. All the songs, without exception, are catchy, and several of, maybe most of them, are ones you can sing along to if you know the lyrics, which helps it make it more rewatchable, more easy to interact with. Some of them are very empowering about how it's okay to be yourself, and in fact, it's great to be yourself. Some of them are just fun and goofy. Not a single one of them is judgmental, mean-spirited, or the like. I know a lot of people hate the word safe space, but in a lot of ways, the movie, especially through music and costuming and performances, create a safe space. Yeah, there's about 45 and a half minutes of music, and the movie is 95 minutes so yeah it's close to half the running time that is music on more than one occasion one musical number will just have ended before another one starts so yeah my personal favorite is either science fiction double feature or the time warp but that's not really fair to the rest of the songs because i've loved those two for so many years they have nostalgic value to me Again, all of them are excellent. Science fiction double feature for its love of, well, science fiction. Don't dream it, be it for the self-empowerment. I'm just a sweet T-word other than the outdated, outdated terms for the pride in oneself and absence of self-hatred when many trans individuals sadly suffer from self-hatred. Time warp for getting you up and dancing. 
Okay, you know what? If I'm being 100% honest, there actually is one thing that I really can't stand about the songs in this, and it is a problem with every single song. Eventually, it ends, but that's what the replay button's for. So, it's not a big problem. I found it extremely difficult not to sing along, but I wanted to save my voice for this video. Sacrifices I make for these, for this channel. Now, let's see. The, yeah, the, the songs, you know, you have great choreography, settings, sets, lyrics, costumes, sound effects, visual editing, just, yeah, and, and so many such incredible voices, they sound absolutely amazing and very distinct, like, yeah, like, the, the when I listened to the music and, and read the, the lyrics, someone had bothered to write out who's singing each time even if 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 i read the lyrics and not that yeah even if i just heard the songs and didn't read that at all i would still be able to tell who was singing because they all have such distinct like i honestly did not think that i would be able to tell apart magenta and columbia but they do have distinct voice just yeah now let's yeah, and as a horror comedy, the movie really works. It is both scary and funny, at times deriving both humor and horror from the same thing. Brad and Janet, in part to get out of the pouring rain, knock on the door of this castle and encounter Riff Raff, this very creepy-looking individual. So, that's scary. And then he opens... Yeah, Riff Raff opens his mouth and dryly notes, Y'all what? Yeah. It's raining. Which is literally exactly what Janet then proceeds to, to say, you know, and yeah, it, it's just, it's perfect. Because, like, he really does not, like, it seems like he's not spoken to a normal sane person in a decade. Like, he has, like, he opens the door slowly. Hello? And it's, yeah, just, you all whack. Instead of just, like, come on in from the rain, you know. Just, he he looks at her for, like, a, a couple of seconds and is like, you're wet. <laughs> I mean, like, like, a, like a Terminator or something. You're upset. Just, I mean, you're not wrong. Technically, that is accurate. So the pacing, I suppose it doesn't keep to the same pace all throughout, but I, like I mentioned earlier, I was never bored. Yeah, without end credits, this movie, the cut that's on Disney Plus, is an hour and 35 and a half minutes long, and 39 minutes with credits, and... Yeah, like, it is, I wouldn't have minded if it went on for longer, but I can understand why some people might, and I've read some people do feel that it should have been trimmed down even further, and I respectfully disagree. Now, the very best aspect of this is the LGBTQ positivity, the camp, the songs. The worst aspect is that it, for some of the trans stuff, it really has not aged well. It's true stereotypical depiction of trans individuals, you know, and, and though the movie is itself clearly saying that there's nothing wrong with being openly trans, it does... <sighs> entertain some stereotypes that are used by transphobes to demonize trans individuals and that is yeah again rather than going into it here you know uh, the link will be in the description box to the Mary Sue article now the worst aspect according to 
others is that it's not that much fun to watch at home without, you know, going to a show. And yeah, like I said, I, I loved it. I, c I can understand why it might be even more fun, but yeah, like that. The thing I was most worried about was that it was overhyped. You know, sometimes when you watch a movie very long time later, you know, some of them... I mean, it's not really that there's something wrong with the movie itself, but people have talked it up. Because they... it means something to them. But, yeah, I, I loved it. I... I would probably... It, yeah, if it felt, there's, it, there's just, there's this vibrancy, it feels alive, it feels like, if, uh, if this movie was a person, it would be the person who gets everybody at the party to dance and laugh and smile and have a good time. The thing I was, you know, what was I most looking forward to? Tim Curry. And, yeah, the movie exceeded my expectations. I am, I will never get this version of Tim Curry out of my head. And that is something I am deeply grateful to this movie for. Because, wow, he is, yeah, just, if I went to a castle and he was my host, I wouldn't faint. Now, the trailers do give too much away, and I don't think, like, this is a movie that's just, you basically have to go in without knowing anything. That That's probably the ideal. Again, I loved it even though I knew everything, but the moment that you know very much at all, it's just not going to have the same effect. But the trailer do, uh, yeah, the trailers do give you a pretty decent idea of what the movie is like, more, more content than kind of, like, the, the trailers from back then, you know, if you've seen trailers, official trailers from back then, they weren't necessarily that great at communicating, like, they, they'd show you clips, and you'd be like, that's gonna be in the movie, but they wouldn't necessarily be, like, the kind of gripping trailer that we get today. Now, the cover and poster do not give too much away, and they do give you a good idea of what the movie is like. So, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has 78%, which means that it is certified fresh, and yeah, it's based on 45 reviews, and the audience score is 85% based on more than a quarter million ratings. And yeah, of the of the 45, only 10 are rotten. And the average rating is 6.90 out of 10. Let's see, the... Yeah, and, and the average user rating on Rotten Tomatoes is 4.2 out of 5. On Metacritic, it has a critic rating of 65 out of 100, 7.9 out of 10 for users, and yeah, and so on IMDb, there are only 616 user reviews, which, yeah. I, I don't know how that, but I, I guess a lot of people just maybe read someone else's review and was like, this person is saying everything I would be saying, so they upvoted it instead, but yeah. The top 100, there are only 5 that gave it 1 out of 10. Nobody gave it 2, 3, or 4 out of 10. One person gave it a 5 out of 10. 2 gave it 6 out of 10. 7 gave it 7 out of 10. 19 gave it 8 out of 10, 20 gave it 9 out of 10, and 41 gave it 10 out of 10. So, yeah, this, this is what we professional critics refer to as a positively received movie when it comes to user voters. So, it, yeah, the people love it. 
And, uh, you know, I uh, should note that some of the critics, they're not really saying it's a bad movie. They're saying it's not as good as the stage show or it works better. It would work better on the stage. But, yeah, 7.4 is the overall rating out of 10 on IMDb from users based on 146,863 users. So, yeah, the the 21.9% gave it 10, 21.4, 8, 20 gave it 7, 13.2 gave it 9, 10.1, 6, 5.15, and everything else is under 3%. So, yeah. Now, the... The, there's not a lot of violence and it's largely implied but there is some and let's see right so the let's see yeah I respectfully disagree with Roger Ebert, R.I.P.'s review of uh, I, he wrote two. He wrote one that you know, like retrospective, and one from back. Anyway, I think, but anyway, I do recommend the review. Uh, yeah, this reviewer has their own site, Pop Optic, and that's one word, and it's a Q, not a C, and yeah. Now, let's see, that brings us, yeah, so, in some countries and regions, you can watch this on Disney+, Plus. otherwise, it's on YouTube, Google Play, Hulu, Amazon Prime, iTunes, Vudu, and Microsoft Store. So, yeah, I rate this 10 of the best musical numbers in any musical ever out of 10. I guess if I had to be 100% like brutally, I don't know, I guess maybe 9. There are a couple of things that, but yeah, almost nothing. So I literally just got done watching this movie. I could sit down and watch it in already and yeah. And that brings us to the spoiler section. So, yeah, from here on out, we are in thoughts territory, spoiler territory. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of analysis, some of MC Faye riff tracks, and other jokes. And, yeah, there, you know, the first thought section is thoughts I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching, where I respond to stuff I read, for example. And yes, so thoughts taken, notes taken while watching. There we go. I love the exaggerated performances for the neat, normal people at the start of the movie. Just they're so clean cut and just all American and perfect. Just and and it's especially I I'm so glad that the movie starts this way because it is in such stark contrast. Like, can you imagine if Ralph and Betty tried to go to the castle? I think their heads might explode. Like, at the end of the day, ultimately the the you know, Brad and Janet were, like, they're also relatively gradually introduced to some of the more, you know, less square aspects of the, you know, the Doctor and, and his guests. But, yeah, it, it just, it's such a, such a strong contrast. When Brad walks after the wedding, and, you know, before proposing, and she's, like, following him, her, you know, her face and the tone of her voice scream propose to me. Like, if she was literally screaming propose to me, 
she still wouldn't be screaming propose to me any more than she already was doing. And as he ponders it, he walks to in front of the tombstones, and then there's a thunderclap, even though the skies are clear. That's ominous. And I love that at the start, like, he starts singing, but, and she tries to go for a kiss, but he, you know, he, like, walks off and says, like, because he's clueless. He's he's too clueless to understand that she's going to want to kiss, and, yeah. I love the lack of enthusiasm in the chorus. You know, he's like, the promise I wouldn't sing. But, yeah, the you know, he's singing Jan Janet, and then goes to the chorus, Janet. And and when she starts singing and she goes, oh, Brad, and they're, oh, Brad. Like, it's to the point where I feel like if they weren't singing, it would be showing more interest in the proposal than them singing like that. And then they carry in a casket. And we get close-ups on their faces right after the song is over, and they could not care less about this. Like, it's just... Can you leave? We just had a wedding. This is exhausting. And I I love the criminologist. I think it's absolutely you know, just spot on, so perfect. And just they didn't have to intro like the way they introduce him, you know, the the brand Janet, you know, the proposal's all done, you know, and it goes to the criminologist. I would like, if I may. To take you on a strange journey, you know, and it's just like he could have just gone directly into the but, but that again, it's pitch perfect for the thing that they're that it's a parody of, and also just like, yeah, camp, you know, it's it's yeah. Brad 100% was actually going to leave the car without knowing exactly where he, he was going before Janet pointed out. I love their performances during that. Like, he's like, I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I'll go for help or something like, you know, he says something like that. And he's, he's a, I forget, I think he might even open the door, but he's about to leave. And like, he physically starts to leave and Janet's like, go where? And he stops and it's like, and he doesn't say it, but just the, when you read his body language, he was going to leave without thinking about where he was actually going. Wow. I I like that, you know, when they're in the car, you know, they're listening to the Richard Nixon, uh, um, yeah, you know, res resignation speech. And she's reading a newspaper. And it's like, the newspaper is going to be necessary because she didn't buy an umbrella, even though that's one of the, things people shout to her during you know yeah the movie if you go to a live showing but yeah she she's reading a newspaper they could you know instead like they could have just had it be oh there was a newspaper in the car or something no they're literally he's listening to richard nixon's resignation speech and she's reading a newspaper like that's how boring and square these people are Remember the scene where one of the Transylvanians or aliens or... Are, are all the Transylvanians aliens? Anyway, try saying that three times fast. Remember that scene where they sit down and just boringly read a newspaper? You don't? That's good because it doesn't exist. That's why you don't remember it. Because they're not that... I'm not saying reading newspapers are automatically like a bad... I'm just saying... You're in a musical, and you're going to be reading a newspaper. Seriously, seriously. That's what you're going to say. Yeah. At, I don't know. I guess if you're in Newsies, maybe read a newspaper during a musical. But otherwise, it's kind of like... Yeah. She chooses what to do in a musical. She Her ability to choose what to do in a musical is the exact same as her ability... To choose something to cover herself with when it's raining. I've already talked about some of the details about when they meet Riff Raff at the castle entrance. It's just, I love it. Like, just every single little detail. 
I love that they have to go past a enter at your own risk sign and that Brad misses it completely, but Janet notices it and it gives her pause, you know, and the, I also kind of love, like, he actually, like, when, you know, Janet doesn't want him to leave because she's worried that he's going to fall in love with someone inside the castle, and I mean, it's not love, it's lust, but even though they do go together, yeah, you know, both of them end up having sex with the doctor. And Riff Raff opens the grandfather clock, and there's a skeleton inside. Just, wow. Every single major character gets such an incredible entrance, especially the ones in the castle. And, yeah, the, the time warp is just incredible. I love that you know, at, at first, it's just, you know, M Magenta, let's see, is it both Magenta and Columbia? I th I forget, I think they might both be there, yeah, when, when, you know, Riff Raff starts singing, and they join in, and Brad and Janet are trying to get away from these people who've just started singing, and so they, they you know, they burst through the door, and there's like a dozen Transylvanians singing and dancing also so like you know they it literally it couldn't have been it couldn't their attempt to get away couldn't have gone worse and jenny's such a square she faints at the time warp dancing and again at the doctor's entrance that one i can understand a little bit more holy crap little nell was incredible at tap dancing the master is married. Nor do I think he ever will be. I mean, at the time, the legis you know, legalization of gay marriage must have seemed completely impossible. You know, thankfully, it is now legal in at least some American states. But then there is also the possibility that Riff Raff is saying the doctor prefers multiple partners. You know, and gay marriage and multiple partners are both completely ethical. And I appreciate that you could interpret it either way. And that's also, it's such a great parody of the the Hayes Code kind of, like, they had to imply things. So, you know, like, because when they made this movie, they could have been at least a little bit more explicit and still gotten away, just barely gotten away with it. You know, there were some pretty wild movies in the in the 70s you know that showed some really mature stuff but yeah they they it's always implied in this i love how at first they're just helping dry off brad and janet but then it escalates to them stripping them down to their underwear some people would give their right arm to see it people like you maybe <laughs> i've seen it and the lab too and the doctor keeps breaking the fourth wall. Somehow I think he was involved with the flat. I, you know, so, like, he's he's singing to them, so you had a flat. How about that? You know, it's like, I don't know exactly how he did that, but then they have, you know, ridiculous sci-fi technology in this movie. So, sure, they probably have a beam that can cause a flat or something, you know, but, yeah. And at one point, like, he... Yeah, that's another thing. The doctor seems incapable of disposing a drink in a normal way. Once he throws it on the camera lens, another time he shoves it in Riff Raff's hand. Also, poor Magenta. Every single time the doctor gets blood on his latex gloves, he just, like, sticks his hands out at Magenta, and she's like, okay, I guess I'll pull it off, pull it off, Ugh. you know, just, like, Dude, she doesn't like that blood any more than you do. Pretty clearly. I'm not saying that it's... I'm having fun with it. I'm not saying there's something wrong with... It. Yeah. In in general, like, there's some great running gags in this. I love the many reaction shots of the Transylvanians. Even Janet eventually applauds at the Doctor before he brings out the creature. Let's see. And the doctor instructs turn on Riff Raff turn on the sonic oscillator. That is the kind of thing 
a 50s sci-fi movie machine would be called and turns a bunch of tabs and all kinds of colors go into the tank. And some of the awakening of Rocky really does feel like right out of a Frankenstein movie. You know, when the doctor runs a finger from Rocky's pecs all the way down to his hot pants, I start getting the sensation that his interest in Rocky isn't purely scientific. Magenta has just released the dogs. Coming. Well, that was fast. I guess. Was, I think at that point it was Janet must be an incredible lover. And Janet starts singing to Rocky. Somehow, I don't think she wants him to sell her something. Or not something that's legal in all states. The song that she gets, it, apparently it's called Toucha 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 Me, has some of the best lyrics in all of the songs in this entire movie. I, I gotta just really quickly, yeah, here we go. Lyrics. I thought there's no use getting into heavy petting. It only leads to trouble and seat wetting. I'll put up no resistance. I want to stay the distance. I've got an itch to scratch. I need assistance. Touch a touch a touch a touch me. I want to be dirty. Thrill me, chill me, fulfill me. Creature of the night. Then if anything grows while you pose, I'll oil you up and rub you down, and that's just one small fraction of the main attraction. You need a friendly hand. Oh, I need action. See, I, I don't know. I just, I get the feeling that the thing she's singing about might be sexual in nature. I don't know. I can't put my finger in it, on it. I just, it's just a feeling I get. I, I don't know, it's probably just me. Under the circumstances, formal wear is optional. <laughs> That's probably a good call, yeah. And Brad and Janet sing along to Happy Birthday to You, finally a song that she knows and approves of. And yeah, I mean, it is technically his birthday his his first birthday you know do, yeah he sings like i've only been a, alive for seven hours or something so yeah now yeah so in case i was too vague uh, during the review or if you skipped ahead to this part the disney plus version doesn't have the line about tender subject you know, and, and the implication that Eddie was the food. We still see the, you know, the visual reveal of Eddie's body under the tablecloth. I don't think you could really edit completely around that. But yeah, like, if I had only watched this, if I hadn't watched clips from other versions, I would not have appreciated that the idea is that they were eating Eddie. I love Dr. Scott's explanation of the transducer and, and how overly wordy it is. It's like, dude, we get it. Just like, just point to it and say, teleportation. You know, because because people know what that means. But yeah, in, in a 50s or 60s sci-fi schlock movie, yeah, it would be like this ridiculous detailed thing, you know, and just, yeah, I, I they, they do such great parody of those I ask for nothing master and you shall receive it in abundance <laughs> seriously every single time the doctor enters or exits the elevator it's deeply memorable I didn't count how many times a musical number is accompanied by one of the characters chasing another or fleeing or some some kind of combination thereof but i think they did a really great job on those you know you've got meatloaf 
in the you know driving and and all the um transylvanians have to jump out of the way and the uh let's see there's the there's the doctor chasing janet and brad is taking the elevator up there now yeah the entire last 20 or 30 minutes of the movie are incredible some of the best sets and songs i love love when he turns them into statues with a medusa ray and they're standing there like apparently their clothes also disappeared that's part of the medusa ray thing and so he dresses them in in under you know in women's underwear like he himself is and yeah and also the disney plus version does not include superheroes only when the end credits played and we got a close-up of Meatloaf when not in motion did I realize you can see on his forehead where the doctor cut to remove his brain. And there's like, I, I don't think he even stitched it up again. I mean, if you're only going to give him half a brain, why bother stitching up, really? So there's just this cut there and there's a little blood and you can see some of the, some of the uh, muscle underneath the flesh. It's just... But yeah, the entire ending, like, I loved that, you know, Riff Raff is like, we're going home. And, and you know, the, the, the doctor is, you know, has this big moment, and the Riff Raff is like, I think you misunderstood. When I said we, I meant I and Magenta. And, you know, and, and after the, the, you know, yeah, so he, he shoots... Rocky, Dr. Frankenfurter, and Columbia, and Magenta is like, I thought you liked them. They like you. And he just freaks out. They never liked me. And like, apparently, I, I understand from, from doing some research, that is intensely, like some LGBTQ people feel that intense feeling of, you know, like, they they can 100% understand what Riff Raff is going through there. So, again, a, a great job on that. And, you know, the, the this thing of, like, like, okay, you know what? You really go too far sometimes. I am taking my partner and I am leaving this party and you can just stay here and think about what you've done because this by you know that again which is basically what Riff Raff is doing there at at the end of the movie that is also a thing that some lgbtq people have been through on more than one occasion in their lives and so again that's like yeah like at, at different parts of the movie you might identify most with different characters but yeah and and when 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 Frank is you know chasing Rocky and saying, Rocky Rocky and and like falling over and like grabbing at Rocky's feet to to try to stop him from running and all this stuff, not literally, but some LGBTQ people feel like that's what it's like for them to try to you know hang on to a, a partner, especially one that they find especially sexually attractive. And, you know, they might be looking for someone else also. And, yeah. That brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. Let's see. Yeah, so now that we're in spoiler territory and I can talk about anything and everything in the movie. I'm going to start with some of the fun stuff before we get into the more heavy, serious stuff. Some really fun sci-fi references. Rocky goes all King Kong at the end where Magenta gets the Bride of Frankenstein here. We have very 50s aliens, basically humans that look a little weird and have ridiculous looking laser guns, speak English. The UFO is ridiculous. And near the end of you know, the entire movie, 
the doctor reveals that he tricked his guests into cannibalism with meatloaf. The doctor made meatloaf out of the singer guy. I, I forget his name right now. And I really love the line, you know, the exchange. What have you done to Brad? Nothing. Why? Do you think I should? And I want to share a few of my favorite call and responses that I've heard or come across in comment sections, etc. You chew people up and then you spit them out. He doesn't spit, he swallows. And then at that point, I I forget if it was Magenta or Columbia, but the person, the live show. Yeah, it was it was an actual stage production. And the yeah, one of them turned to that audience member and said, you know it, honey. And Janet to Brad goes, I'll come with you. And someone said, that'll be a first. And let's see. Then... Right, so, yeah. The movie's very positive in its depiction of LGBTQ. They're not hiding, they're celebrating and celebrating. You know, it's the Transylvanian, what was it, Con conference or something. But, you know, it's not just, oh, they're, you know, dancing. No, no, it's a celebration. They're celebrating who they are. They're here, they're, keyword, get used to it. Of course, at the same time, a number of LGBTQ individuals don't want to be seen the way that they are depicted in this. They just want to live a life where they're blending in with everybody else. And I realize that some people will respond to this with a statement that they can just not watch the movie, but even if they don't watch it, a lot of other people have and will. And, you know, when it came out, and possibly to an extent to this day, it put an image in a lot of people's heads of what LGBTQ individuals look like. A lot of people think that they are inherently different beyond gender identity and attraction, which are not good reasons for excluding someone. A good reason would, for example, be if they're violent, which is a good example, which is a good argument for excluding the homophobes and transphobes who are violent. Not all are. You know, that is an issue where this movie is dated and has not aged well today. Today, visibility is not as big of an issue, given the recent slate of Don't Say Gabriels. It is obviously still a problem. It's more trans rights. It's fighting to stop violence against trans people. And some people take that to extreme, where they say they're too different to coexist in society with people who don't dress like that. Sometimes encounter people who say that LGBTQ individuals shouldn't dress the way that a number of them do for pride parades. And, you know, to that I say, they're not hurting anyone. And... Yeah, so the doctor is making a body, so like Frankenstein, but where that leads to a horrifying result, which some have interpreted as being an anti-gay message, a man obsessed with another man's body, and it ends in disaster, it's, you know, not natural, all, all these things, which, you know, homosexuality is all over nature. You know, there's more to it than that, but that's the part I want to bring up, because here we also have a man obsessed with another man's body, but where the physically unattractive Frankenstein's monster ended up killing a bunch of people, the hyper-masculine unattractive Rocky basically goes around having sex with anything with a pulse. And I really appreciate that they did choose to make this character male and not female. I mean, it's not like we straight men didn't get a science fiction movie where an attractive woman is created in weird science, which I think they even made a TV show out of. You know, Rocky in this movie does not exist for the straight male viewer. You know, the doctor says he, you know, he, I didn't make it, I didn't make him for you, or he wasn't made for you, something like that, to Janet. And, you know, so, so yeah, it's, you know, it is a, a man created for other men to have sex with. Now... Let's see. You know, obviously not every man who's gay, bi, or pan necessarily wants the kind of mindless but attractive and easy to get with type that Rocky is, but the movie is saying that there's nothing wrong with the ones who do. Now, 
Yeah, so the LGBTQ characters in this movie have created a safe haven for themselves and each other where they can be as fabulous as they want to be. Perhaps some of them naturally are. Plenty of people who love campy science fiction are not LGBTQ individuals, and plenty of LGBTQ individuals don't like camp and or science fiction, but there is a certain overlap. And yeah, the doctor killing Meatloaf does sadly play into the stereotype of trans individuals being killers. This trope is seen in movies as big as The Sons of the Lambs and Trust to Kill. Obviously, it is awful that the doctor tricks Brad and Janet into having sex with him, which is a form of rape. And I mean, the movie itself, I feel like the ending kind of says that they're, you know, by the, by the end, there was something wrong with the doctor trying to make these people like, you know, be like him. And, let's see. You know, yeah, Riff Raff basically says, you know, you go too far. You know, and it's not like he isn't also, you know, really out, out there. But, yeah, so. I do really appreciate that after decades of keyword coding, this movie just comes out in the open, you know, like, there, there were all these movies that would have male characters be effeminate, maybe look longingly at other male characters and such. And then this one comes out and says, here's some characters who are bi or gay and have sex like that. They're, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with bisexuality or polyamory. One argument in favor of the idea of being a transphobic element of the film is that the idea of trans individuals as people who commit sexual assault and rape is actually a huge part of transphobia to this day. The numbers show that statistically speaking, very few trans individuals are like that. Like statistically speaking, if you're going to think that person is a rapist based entirely on someone's appearance, it should be when you see a straight white cis man. So, you know, I've already mentioned... I am straight and cis, so obviously I'm not arguing in favor of this. I'm saying it's absurd to make that kind of judgment based purely on appearance. And, you know, some of the people claiming that trans individuals are more likely to be rapists are Catholic priests, who are actually more likely to be rapists and pedophiles. A lot of the people using the arguments are just trying to justify their transphobia. It can sometimes be very easy to catch some of these people in their hypocrisy. I'm not saying that every single individual of them is a hypocrite, but if you're standing in front of a crowd who, of people who think that trans individuals are sexual predators, ask how many of the conservatives ones still support Matt Gates, Roy Moore, and Donald Trump. That last one you especially have a lot of conservatives still supporting, despite all the credible allegations. And ask how many of the left-wingers still support Bill Clinton. I think it's obvious by this point, but just for the record, no, I do not support anyone who has had credible allegations of sexual assault or rape against them. What I just said goes for homophobia as well. And the fact that the doctor dresses up as a woman to have sex with Brad plays into the concept of traps. I don't think there's anything wrong with a cis person having sex with a trans person. I do think there's something very wrong with murder. Killing anyone in any circumstance other than when killing them is the only way to prevent greater harm is unacceptable but killing a sexual partner is one of the most disgusting sex is arguably the most powerless and vulnerable human experience that one can consent to it's an expression of trust taking advantage of that trust after satisfying your sexual urge using their body which is the only way to express it when you follow up sex by killing your partner that is disgusting. They didn't trap you. You trapped them when you started murdering them. And yes, I'm aware it's called trap because of the meme. And yeah, at the end of the movie, the heteronormative two leads are forced to dress up in women's underwear. In the real world, the forcing element of it is wrong ethically, but some audience members could vicariously experience, similar to the famous interracial kiss on Star Trek The Original Series, which was also forced, it was a way to get it past censors. It's either forced on good guys or practiced intentionally by bad guys. And for a number of people, it made them realize that 
you know, they might have been assigned male at birth, but, you know, she was a woman. It also did make some cis men realize they wanted to cross-dress, which sadly sometimes confused for trans identity. The movie itself doesn't... I'm, I'm not sure the movie itself understands the difference, and I don't think a lot of... There, there were a lot of people who didn't understand the difference when the movie was made. And trans identity being an issue of gender identity is more important to recognize as valid as cross-dressing, which is a kink. It's still valid. There's nothing wrong with it. The only way it would be wrong to, is to practice without consent, like with all sex. And the incestuous lovers, Riff Raff and Magenta, do play into the false stereotype some have that once you go outside of straight sexuality, it's just a matter of time before you end up with something like incest. Now, let's see. I think I heard someone argue that, I'm just going to call it Touch Me, is a misogynistic song. And I mean, it. it is technically written by someone who at the, at the time identified as male. I don't know. I mean, I think the idea is that it's supposed to be empowering. It's not really shaming her for it. In fact, the, when, you know, when characters try to shame her, when, yeah, when when the sex between Janet and Rocky is like when characters try to shame others for that, it's it's ridiculous. It's like a parody. You know, it keeps going back. I I guess if I had to say, I think they could have trimmed that down a tiny bit, but you know, it got the point across. It's it's ridiculous. It's it's like something out of Benny Hill or a sitcom or something. It. it you know the movie is clearly saying this is ridiculous don't don't shame people for you know yeah i mean it's brad is trying to shame janet even though he had sex with uh, the the doctor once he realized that yeah that the doctor was the doctor and not janet you know the, dr frank is trying to shame um uh, rocky even though he's just like literally if the doctor wasn't off having sex with brad and janet if he went and had sex with rocky instead of having sex with them rocky wouldn't have been having sex with them you know it's yeah and the let's see the um the doctor, it's not really any of his business. He's not in the relationship. You know, obviously, if not for the other cheating, it is reasonable for Brad to get upset with Janet and the uh, the doctor to get upset with Rocky. But like I just said, they're all cheating. You know, no, no one is being um, monogamous. Monogamous, that's it. I almost said monotonous, but only because of a joke. That are a really long time ago, where a Christian student apparently actually read, wrote in their, you know, and handed in a paper that said, a Christian should have only one wife. This is called monotony. But anyway, yeah, none of them are practicing monogamy, which, again, the movie says you shouldn't have to. You know, there, there's really no monogamous partnership that the movie celebrates. Yeah, so, you know, but, yeah, I can understand, I, like, if you feel, if you as a woman feel that it's, it, that touch me is upsetting, misogynistic, sexist, I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong. I do think that it's trying to also be empowering, that the, like, uh, what's the word? she's taking charge you know she's not regretting what you know and and essentially every major character really indulges in something that they feel like at some point in the movie you know the movie's in favor of that so but yeah it is still like a lot of people already a lot of men already think that women are the way that Janet presents in Touch Me, so it is, yeah. Now, let's 
see. Okay, so I'm going to get, let's see. I meant to put a warning before I started talking about transphobia, but I've been talking about that for minutes now, so never mind. I will go through the rest of my notes on that. But yeah, I'm not the first person to talk about the one joke that transphobes have, some variation of I identify as an attack helicopter. They think they're utterly demolishing the trans community with their genius logical argument, but Really, all they're actually doing is communicating how incredibly shallow, superficial, and intellectually lazy they are. The point is supposed to be how illogical and nonsensical the idea of someone identifying as a different gender than what they were assigned at birth, which ignores how successful countless people have been in transitioning and how happy they express being post-transition. Like, you know, I, if it was so illogical, how is it also so possible? How is it making so many people happy? Illogical things don't tend to do that. You know, like, as an example, some people think that drug use will make them happy. Now, I'm not gonna get off on a thing here. I think the war on drugs is has caused a lot more pain than drugs would have on their own, but yeah, you know, if you can control it, drugs can have some um, positive have some benefits but if you are trying to use drugs to consistently escape from reality that can really go wrong that is something that you know and and for a while i you know you heard people comparing as, as possible they still i i try not to listen to too many conservative comedians these days because they there's nothing there they're they're not even trying to be funny anymore they're just like you, you they might as well just be saying i hate those people and then a bunch of people cheer because they also hate those people and they don't stop and actually craft a joke like you can say you can make politically incorrect like i i very re, just recently I want to say it was the Netflix, I'm going to real quick find, let's see, it was like Netflix is a joke, um, can't believe I'm blanking on his name, my favorite stand-up comedian, uh, Let's see, it's, oh, right, Jimmy Carr, so, yeah, if you, let's see, um, hmm, okay, I'm having a little trouble finding exactly, okay, I'm reading that a bunch of people think that the joke was too well, okay a different joke that he made in the same set uh yeah which was about the holocaust so i'm not yeah anyway it is possible to make jokes about sensitive subjects you know just last week i talked about how much i loved jojo rabbit and the great dictator as well as the producers so it is possible but you do have to have something there you can't just say i don't understand this you know it's it's like it's like on on an animal level on a primal level like i'm sure a bunch of chimpanzees would find it hysterical but the fact that actual human beings, adults with developed brains, think that it's that funny, it's just like, yeah. You know, there, there are, like off the top of my head, I remember that Elliot Page has expressed being really, really happy 
post transition you know and yeah like you know a bunch of conservatives don't seem to think that it's possible but yeah there are there are tons of trans people in the world right now who are you know who've never felt better now let's see so yeah going back to you know illogical things don't tend to make people happy they just lead to more frustration as more time and effort is spent failing to deliver positive results by which i mean that some illogical beliefs do lead to some results some change but it's stuff that doesn't actually improve the lives of the people who hold the illogical beliefs so stuff like well transphobia homophobia islamophobia etc I love when transphobes point to that clip of Ben Shapiro intentionally misgendering Zoe Tur, a trans woman, and she, you know, verbally threatened him. Transphobes say, "Oh, that's evidence that trans people are violent." I would love for trans for Ben Shapiro to intentionally misgender any mildly insecure straight cis man on camera. Not that I'm saying that trans woman was insecure. She actually came across as quite confident anyway I'm thinking Joe Rogan maybe a Republican running for office something like that see how well that goes I would be very surprised if they leave it at a threat they will almost definitely strike him and transphobes wouldn't refer to that as evidence that we straight cis men are violent they would point to it as being deserved and if people started barring straight cis men from bathrooms throwing them out of them based on suspicions with no proof a lot would be furious it's like people saying that gay couples cannot conceive. Like, basically, the argument relies on the idea that every couple has to procreate rather than adopt one of the countless children whose lives would be greatly improved by adoption and without using artificial insemination, which, to be fair, is expensive these days. Evidently, the people making this argument have mistakenly believed... Belie yeah, mistakenly believe that we are dealing with a problem of too few people on the planet. I realize that some countries are having problem having problem having enough children to maintain the same amount of people living in the country but honestly immigration reform holds the solution to that problem we actually have a lot of people on this plan i'm not i don't think i'm sufficiently educa educated on the subject to go into whether we have too many if there is such a thing and need to focus more on making sure that the people who currently have too little space to live on are granted more since as renegade cut points out there's plenty of space where people could live that just isn't being used for that or a few people are living there and could easily adjust to having less space so that the people who currently have too little could also live there so yeah if you if you watch this video because you wanted to you know be be super positive about how you know all the all the energy of the movie and the fun songs and such yeah i seriously did mean to warn that i was about to be a brain down bummer dude cuz that's what i just was were anyway see this is where i usually like suggest something people could comment tell you what if this movie really changed your life for the better like you know yeah I would love to hear about it please post that post that down in the comments you can also post if you just really like the movie you know and you're cis and, and straight but this is one of the few videos where I will say I really really don't want like usually I say if you post something hateful in my comment section I'm probably just gonna ignore because you know sometimes when you delete that gets way more attention than anyway I would very much prefer if no one posted anything hateful in the comments not towards this movie not towards any LGBTQ people you know just yeah tell you what if you need to vent about some transphobe or homophobe that's that's fine but anything else hateful i am going to seriously consider removing the comment but yeah if you like this video 
please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is Ms. Marvel, and one talking about my spoilerville thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus Star Wars show, which these days is Obi-Wan Kenobi. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. Hope you enjoy watching and watching as I enjoy watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Remember, don't dream it, be it.